Hey everybody. Today, Rado runs through Above and Below, which is a very interesting, very clever, and very beautiful Euro-style village building game that is on Kickstarter right now, which I'm going to do a run through so you can decide whether you might want to back it or not. And let me just start off by saying again, this game is lovely. It is gorgeous. It's from designer artist Ryan Lockett, who always does the art for his games. And his games are always end up being beautiful, and this is no exception. Now in this game, we are trying to set up a new village, uh, but, you know, each player. Here's my player board with the beginning of my village, this little collection of huts that has three beds, which is where my three villagers will sleep. And each one of these villagers has kind of a specialty. Jen, she's starting out over here, the second player, with the same basic setup. One, uh, one building with three beds and a family of three, I suppose. Now, what these special abilities are is this fellow, he can, the, this quill means that he can recruit more people so he can get more people into the village. The hammer means that more buildings can be built. And you can see there's a whole bunch of buildings out here that can be built, both above and below ground. And then this little girl over here, she's particularly good at exploring the caverns below ground. And because you, you'll notice at the beginning, we just have this one building, but as we start to explore the caverns, we'll find this big network of chambers where we can build. And so we can be building our village above ground and we can be building outposts below ground. And each one, each of these buildings has different things like, uh, you know, if I build this outpost below ground, I'll start being able to harvest fish. Um, and this one, I'll be able to harvest ore, uh, which can be, you know, very, very lucrative. This one's just worth four bucks, but it also makes it so whenever I build more buildings, I get a buck back. This one just increases my income. I guess there must be some gold in that dark cave. Plus, I get victory points at the end of the game for every underground outpost I've built. Whereas these ones above ground, well, this one increases my income, gives me four points at the end of the game. This one gives me another bed so I can afford to have more villagers in my village. This one is three victory points, more income, and a bed. There's also 10 key buildings, you can see there's a little key right there, that are set up at the start of every game. There's always going to be these 10 buildings, and several of them are all about scoring, a lot of them are scoring victory points at the end of the game. These ones down here are about getting really good special powers at the beginning of the game. And then finally up here, you can see there's more villagers waiting to be recruited or trained or hired, or whatever you want to call it, to basically join our villages. So, we're all set up, ready to go. I am starting with five bu or seven bucks, because I'm the first player. Jen is the second player. She starts with eight bucks, and we are ready to go here in the first of seven rounds that this game will last. Okie doke. So let's get going. I'm the first player, and I've got my three people, and this is kind of a worker placement game, and that these are my workers, and I will place them in various places to make them do stuff. And remember, I've got a builder, I've got a trainer, or a teacher, I suppose, and I've got an explorer. Now, these are all the actions I can do. It's just a nice little handy-dandy reminder. I can go exploring underground, although if I, need, if I want to go exploring, I have to send at least two people. One person cannot go exploring alone. It's too dangerous, so I have to send at least two. Although if I wanted, I could send all three, and I would up my chances of success, because you can see there's dice on here. And so the more people you send, the more likely you are to be successful and bring some good stuff back up from underground. So I can go exploring. I can harvest. Now that means, say, if at some point I had actually gotten this underground place where, they are, where one can harvest fist, fish, I can use anybody to go harvest a fish so I can start collecting resources, which could up my income and stuff like that, or be potentially worth victory points. I can build. Now it's because I have one builder. That means on this round, I can build one building, and I have to pay the cost. This one costs five bucks, seven bucks, 16 bucks, 18 bucks. There's a wide range of prices, so I could build. I could uh, teach or train somebody, because I've got one teacher here, and that would let me pay two, three, three, four, or five bucks to get one of these new characters to join the village. These over here, they're special characters that only join under certain circumstances. Special events might happen that would let those special characters join. Let's see. And finally, I can just do some basic, what is that called? Just work or forage or something like that? Uh, basically, this is the action you do if you don't have anything better to do. Basically, you can have any character do this action and make one additional buck. So I could just have all three of my characters just um, do some day labor and make three more bucks. Oh, it's kind of bugging me now. What is the name of that action? Not that it even remotely matters. It is labor. Yeah, they can do day labor. So I'm going to start out, and since I am the first player, and that means 
I, I get first dibs at anything on the board, I think I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to have my builder build something for me. So I take him and I put him over here and this is the exhausted area. After somebody's done work, they get put over here and they're going to need a good night's sleep in a bed before they'll be ready to work again in a future round. So I'm, do, I'm activating this guy to do the worker action. Now that means I can spend money to build any of these. Although I can't build any underground outposts yet because I haven't explored the underground. So right now I can only build any of these buildings or any of these. And I think for starters, I'm going to go ahead and build this one. This is a very popular one to grab at the beginning. This only, it's very cheap, cheapest building in the game. It only costs two bucks. And it doesn't really give me any immediate benefit. It doesn't generate goods, it doesn't give me victory points, it doesn't give me another bed to sleep in, but it does a very valuable thing. It gives me two re-rolls. When I go exploring, because when you explore, you have to roll the dice to see how successful you are. I can re-roll two dice twice, or I can, do, I can roll two rolls because I now have this special power. So that was my action. Now it is Jen's turn. What is she going to do? Let's see. And now the interesting thing is, I cannot build anything else. I can't build anything anymore. So um, Jen knows she doesn't have to rush after trying to build a building because you know there I can't build anymore because I don't have another builder. Let's see here. Although in spite of that, I think Jen's going to build as well. You know, if there were three or four players, I mean, it's it's not at all uncommon that everybody at the beginning of the round tries to build one of these early cheap special power buildings so that everybody gets a unique special power. And so Jen, she's going to give herself a special power as well. She is going to pay four bucks. There's five, four change. She's going to take one of these buildings that costs four bucks to build. Now this is one that's very special because when you recruit a new member of your village, you know, these people up here, which you have to pay money for, so this is a new power that Jen has that I don't have. I have the reroll power, she has the recruitment power. Normally when you recruit somebody, you know, using a teacher, they immediately come into your exhausted area, which means you can't use them. But Jen now has the power so that whenever she re recruits somebody, they come into the active area ready to go and ready to help out. So that was Jen's turn, now it is my next turn. So I've still got five bucks. I could go on ahead and, and use this teacher, put her in the exhausted area, to teach and I could recruit another member of my you know, my village, so my village can get bigger so I can do more actions in the future, but I'm not going to do that. Remember how I said if you want to go exploring, you need to send two people? I'm going to go exploring. I am going to go below. We've been above for a little bit, now it's time to go below. So we come over here, we grab the top card from the exploration deck, alrighty, and you know, so I take that, this is where we're going to explore, and um, you know, I might have like four or five people here, I could send all of them exploring if I wanted, but as it is, I'm going to send these two characters, uh, like a mom and a dollar or something like that, to explore this cavern, because remember, they, neither of them can go alone. If, um, this guy hadn't, if this guy wasn't exhausted, he could have gone to help out, but these two are exploring on their own. So here we go, we're about to explore. First thing we do is we roll a single die. And let's see, I got a one. Check the chart, and one is number seven. And now here's where the game truly comes alive. It introduces something truly magical. The above and below explore book. Now I assume with the real game, this is obvious. This is, you know, I should say, everything you're looking at here is prototypes, although one of the most gorgeous prototype games I've ever had. This is clearly, obviously, a placeholder, just a printout. I'm sure the uh, real game will come with a nice glossy book of this. But anyway, this is the explore book. What I've got to do now is, if, if players who have ever played uh, Tales of the Arabian Nights or Agents of Smirsh, they know what's coming. Let's see, I rolled a one, so that means I've got to go to entry number seven. So what I do is, I hand the book to, to Jen, to another player. She goes and finds entry number seven right here, and then she reads it to me. I don't get to read this, she reads it to me, and I'm going to read it to you guys right now. Here's what these two girls ran into when they were exploring. Ah! You come across a traveling merchant in a slanted cavern, shafts of daylight from cracks in the ceiling, lighting up the granite, cracked floor. Come, take a look at my wares, says the merchant through his yellow veil, reining in his green-skinned pack lizard. The man is traveling alone. As far as you can tell, he is unarmed. You could probably snatch one of his bags and run before he'd be able to stop you. Do you haggle with the man or do you steal from him? And now, so Jen just read that to me and I've got to make a choice. Am I going to steal from the merchant, or I should say, am I going to attempt to steal from the merchant? Which means I have to get a total, uh, you know, and so Jen tells me, my choices are steal from the merchant, you need to get a three, 
or haggle, which means you either need to get a four or a six. And this is where the dice come in. I've now got to roll dice. But before I do that, I gotta choose. Am I gonna steal? Stealing, if I, if I can get three successes, I will get something. I don't know what I'll get, but it's obviously not a very nice move. And chances are, because I'll steal from somebody, my reputation will fall. This is a meter in the game that um, has a big impact at the end of the game. Because uh, in a two-player game, whoever has the best reputation at the end of the game scores four points. With more players, whoever has the best gets six, and second place is four, and third place is two. But in a two-player game, there's only um, first place, which gets four points. So, if I'm going to steal from this guy, if I succeed at it, it's very likely that my reputation will fall. And then Jen will pull into the lead, and she might end up being the most reputable at the end of the game and get four points. Also, if my reputation falls too far, I'll start losing points. But on the flip side, when I do things that are likely to drop my reputation, the rewards are usually very nice. So I've got to decide, am I going to steal from this merchant, try to get a three success, and get whatever my reward is, and like I said, probably drop my reputation, or instead, I could haggle with him. Now that's going to be harder, because to steal, I just need to get a three. But to haggle, I need to get a four. Or, if I haggle really well, I'll haggle really well and get a really great reward if I get a six. All right, so what am I going to do? Now, to make that decision, I've got to look and see what this uh, mother-daughter exploring team is capable of. That's where these little markers come here, these, uh, these dice tell me. That basically, I'm going to roll a dice for her and I'm going to roll a die for her. But remember, I get re-rolls. So that means I, I'm better than anybody else at exploring because I can re-roll. If I roll a two or better, she will produce one success. This is a lantern. She'll produce one explore point or lantern point or success point or whatever. So it's very unless I roll a one, it's very likely she'll be successful. Now mom over here, if I roll, she's guaranteed to produce a success. Even if I roll crappy and only get a one, she will produce one success. But if I get a three, four, five, or six, as long as I don't get a one or a two, she'll produce three. So it's possible for the two of these together to generate three success if they both roll well. If she gets at least a two and she gets at least a three, then they would produce three success, which means I would be successful at stealing from the merchant. But what I can do is I could still go for the haggle because say I do really well and I get the, um, the, you know, the three but I need to get at least four, because remember, it said I needed to have it, uh, to be successful with haggling, I need at least a four. To get a four, after I'm done rolling, if I want, and, you know, and I get whatever, so however many successes a character gets, I can exhaust them, or no, sorry, exert them. And if I exert them, that means I take them, and instead of them being exhausted at the end of the day, they are exerted, and they, they're hurt, and they basically won't be available to me next round. So it would be possible for me to go for a four and do the good thing instead of the uh, evil thing. But to achieve it, I will have to hurt somebody, which means I'll have fewer guys last turn. Now, it's early days, and uh, man, right off the bat, if, if, I, if I steal, I'll, I'll probably get something good. Like I said, usually the rewards for stealing are pretty good. But my reputation will go down. But, you know, I can get my reputation back up. I don't think I want to. If, if for me to haggle, I will have to exert one of these. I guess they'll end up, you know, talking so long, their throat will get sore. And that's why they, uh, they have to exert themselves to haggle really well. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to go for stealing. I'm going to steal from the merchant. Okay. And so now, and again, Jen reminds me, I've got to get at least a three. So first I'm going to roll for the daughter. And I'm trying to get a two. And she got a six. So she did better than two. That means she has produced one success. Now for mom, she needs to get at least a three. Let's see what she does. And it's a two. Now that means she did not get a three. So she only made one success. So I've only got two success. It's not good enough. But remember, I can re-roll two times. So let's re-roll again for mom, see if we can do better. A three, there we go. So I did it. I produced one, two, three successes. And so, hooray, I've stolen from the merchant. And so Jen now informs me that my reward when I run off into the night is, well, as expected, my reputation drops one. Oops, I'm sorry, That's, I'm green. So my reputation drops one. And, but my reward, what did I steal? I got, where was it? A, um, a fish, so I stole a fish from the man and another coin, okay. And money can be very, very tight in this game, so getting some more money is pretty good. So we got some money and some fish from the merchant. Must have been a fish merchant. All right, and that was it. So now they had a very successful outing of theft underground, and because they were successful in exploring this, I have now added a new tile to my board. I can now build underground 
um, outposts in addition to above ground because we have successfully explored this cavern. All right, and so now that was my second action. As you can see, I'm done. There's nothing more I can do this round because I've used up all my workers. So now it is Jen's turn. Now she can do the same thing. She could go on ahead and explore, but um, she doesn't have that reroll to get out of trouble like I do. And her special power is when she recruits people, they come in ready to go. So I think she wants to take advantage of that. Jen is going to use her teacher, her village teacher, to recruit somebody. All right, so she's got four bucks. So this guy up here costs two, three, three, four, and four. So which one does Jen want? Hmm. You know, they're put out there completely random. And over time, you know, ones that don't get bought will get cheaper. Uh, let's see, that kid. This fish guy is really nice because he's a re he he's a teacher. But he's also a really good explorer because uh, on a one, when he rolls a one, he gets guaranteed two. And on a five or a six, he gets three. So he's an excellent explorer if I want to start trying to explore more. Yeah, as opposed to, say, this builder guy who gets two if he rolls a three and three if he rolls a six. So he's, he's, he can do really well, but you know, he's got a 50, 50, or you know, only a, a, two, a one in three chance of failing completely. And there's this, oh, um, this lady builder who um, automatically succeeds with one no matter what and, ha and has a 50 chance of doing two. You know what? I think Jen's going to pay a bit more. She's going to pay three. One, two, three. And she's going to hire the fish man. Do, 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 do. Hello, fish man. Now, normally when you train somebody or recruit somebody, they come in over here and because they're exhausted from you know, getting to the village. But since Jen's got this special power, he comes in right over here and is ready to go. So now Jen could explore with these two characters because this guy is very good at exploring. She's still got one buck, so she could do other stuff as well. Oh, oh. Uh, you know what? I think I changed my mind. Jen, instead of getting this fish guy, which costs three bucks, she'll get this builder guy who only costs two bucks. That's even cooler. All right. So it only costs two bucks, so Jen still has two bucks to her name. All right. And again, he doesn't come exhausted. Uh, it must be the twin brother of this guy. He came in ready to go. So now it's back to me. It's my turn. I have nobody else, so I have to pass. Now you can pass early if you want, but basically my, my turn is over. And so now it's Jen, and she'll keep going until she's done. Now she's got these two. They could go exploring, but that's not what's going to happen. Jen is going to have this girl, who is you know a pretty good explorer right from the get-go. She can produce two. Um, she has a 66% a chance of producing a two explorer. But she is going to exhaust herself by doing some labor which means she's just going to make $1. All right, so now Jen is up to three bucks. I'm passed, so Jen gets to go again. Now, since Jen's got another builder, she's going to have him build, and she's going to spend her last three bucks to get this building, which is another super special power. And now this is really cool. This power is... Well, actually, it's kind of weird. I mean, this prototype is, I believe this icon is incorrect because there's nothing in the rulebook about this icon. I think this is actually supposed to be this icon. This is supposed to be an icon for building because this is, the rules make clear that if I have this fortress, whenever I build a building, I get a buck back after I've successfully building. I think that's the same thing for this because this icon, well, I'm not really quite sure. That's how Jen and I played it so far when we played. So Jen has given herself another special ability. When she recruits people, they're ready to go. Whenever she builds, she gets a dollar back. All right, and does she get a dollar back now? I don't, that's not how we played before because she just got that power. Let's see, do the rules say? I might have to ask Ryan about this. So I don't think they do. Player owns a card with a symbol. He gains one coin after purchasing a building card. He must pay the full amount for the building before collecting the bonus coin. So yeah, it could go either way. Whether I'm supposed to, I, but you know what, that I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say we do get a bonus coin. This could be wrong. It might be that we're not supposed to get a bonus coin for the successful building of the bonus coin giving building. It's probably not. No, it's probably not. That's how Jen, we'll, we'll say it. So anyway, Jen's completely broke and I've passed and now she's done. So she has to pass as well. We have finished the first of seven rounds. Now, at the end of a round... Before we go on, we, um, we have to set some stuff up. If any, oh, oh, whoops, one other thing I forgot. When Jen had her, her girl here do labor, the first person to do day labor, not only do they make a buck, they also produce a cider. So Jen also got herself a cider in addition to the one buck she got. I totally forgot about that. So now um, we're ready to set up for the next day. Um, the round marker moves to round number two. If, there's, if somebody took a cider, a new one comes out. And if nobody had taken a cider, there uh, we wouldn't have put a new one out. New villagers come out, which means all the old villagers get cheaper. And a new one comes out. Let's see. Oh, this is a frog man. 
Uh, it looks kind of familiar for fans of Ryan Lockett from, uh, what's it, City of Iron. You might remember that frog race. I guess all these, do all these games take place in the same universe? That's really cool. This must, this game must be taking place in the same universe as City of Iron. Because I'm pretty sure, wasn't there a frog? Oh, no, no, I'm thinking of the hog. No, there were frogmen too in that game. Nice. Anyway, sorry, that's totally as an aside. So, new side, new villagers. Um, and now, our villagers rest. So I've got three villagers, they're all exhausted. I've got three beds, so they all get a good night's sleep, and that means they're ready to go the next day. Jen's got a slightly trickier problem. She's only got three beds, and she's got four people. So only three of them can rest up because she didn't get any buildings that give her more beds. So she'll have the builder, and the builder, and the teacher wake up. But here's the use of the cider. You, whenever you want, you can use the cider to, um, for somebody who isn't gonna wake up, you know, because there's not enough bed for them to sleep in, they can wake up too. It's like a temporary one-use bed. So, Jen used the cider, and now all of her four people, so she has four workers to use next round, whereas I've only got three, but on the flip side, I got six bucks and a fish, and Jen is completely broke, but she's got a lot of buildings with two special powers. So, uh, everybody, and now we collect our income. Now, at the beginning of the game, oh, shoot, 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 I should have mentioned. Um, let's see, I had, when I got this fish, when I took the fish, I had three choices of what I could do with it. I could just put it off to the side, that's what I did. I can put it for sale. And what that means is, if any other player wants, they can buy it from me. They have to pay at least three bucks, although we have to haggle and barter and come to a true agreement. But if somebody desperately needs a fish, and I've got a fish, I could put it here and they could buy it from me if we can reach an agreement. The other thing you can do with a good is, you can put them down here. Once you put them onto your progress meter, which is what this is, they get permanently locked. You lose them for any other function in the game. But what this means is, before, I was going to get an income of four. But now, I'm going to get an income of five at the end of the turn. And what I've also made is, every fish I collect for the rest of the game is worth one point. Now, this, is a, this advancement meter is very, very cool. Because, you know, of course, I just want to throw this down here so I can make five bucks instead of four. That's really awesome. But here's the thing. As you can see from this little meter, fish are really common. They're a very, very easy resource to get. Uh, the only thing more common is fruit, and then mushrooms, and like the, the most uncommon thing in the game is amethyst and ore and stuff like that. So here's the thing. If, over the, if I'm gonna be able to collect a lot of fish in the game, and you know, if I get this building, which I could build into this spot, yeah, I could start collecting fish. I don't if I collect a lot of fish, I don't want them to be worth one point. I want them to each fish to be worth two points or even three points, or four points, or heck, even possibly seven points for every fish. But for me to be able to put the fish here, I have to have filled all these other spaces up with different resources. So you've got this really interesting bit of tension in the game. Do you just go for a quick increase to your income, so I'm making five instead of four, or do I save this? Do I start building up fish? And in the meantime, if when I go exploring, maybe I find a mushroom, and, and maybe I find an amethyst, and maybe I find a fruit, and by that point in the game, maybe we're two thirds of the way through the game, and by, I've also got three fish, at that point, I might say, what the heck, let's put all three of my fish right here, because that means my three fish are worth nine points total instead of three points total. So it's a really cool system. And because of that, I think even though I could have put locked my fish in and gotten five income instead of four, I'm going to wait on that. I'm just going to take four income. Uh, just take five, there's one back. And Jen, she also gets four income. One, two, three, four. Okay. And because, you know, Jen, she only gets four income as well, she hasn't gotten anything. And I'm saving this fish, and, you know, I'm going to hopefully get this thing so I can harvest more fish. And later on, I'll make my fish worth a lot. Also, in addition, in addition to my fish being whatever they're worth here, if I get this $11 building built, every um, fish, fruit, cider, and mushroom is worth an additional point at the end of the game, plus the three points I get for this building. So you can really start building a long-term strategy depending on how it goes. This ill-gotten fish might win me the game if I play my cards right. So... Um, everybody got their income, and uh, let's see what else happens. Oh, right. If uh, if if I had this and it was empty, or oh, actually, oh wait a minute, this isn't empty. This is not a recurring one. Let's see. Let's see if I can find a building that is a refer. Okay, yeah. If if I had this building. What this income icon means is, if I'd already harvested fish from here, I would get another fish. I would put another fish onto this building right now. So that, you know this. For the rest of the game, this building would generate one fish for me to harvest. This one 
that's actually out that doesn't have an icon. This just means when I, when I put this building into play, it has two fish on it and it will never produce more than those two. It's not an evergreen tile. Okay. So um, we're not refreshing any goods and then turn order changes. So next round, Jen will be the first player. I will be the second player and we're good to go. So that was it folks. That was one full round, the first of seven rounds of Above and Below. Now, if you'd like to watch another round or two as we do some more exploration, maybe get to hear another story, um, you know, see how well it works out, see what Jen's gonna do now that she started building, because now that she, you know, she wants to build more because she gets income from building, but she wants to hire people more because they get to work right away. She definitely needs another bed for people to sleep in. And me, I'm still really good at exploring. Am I gonna explore more? Well, you can hit the button that's on screen or follow the show notes to go to our extended playthrough or go to final thoughts. Your choice in five, four, three, two, one.